we're going to talk today about warfare, specifically spiritual warfare. And again, you know, the, this whole series is about these spiritual principles and laws that exist, whether we acknowledge them to or not. And so our understanding of, of how to operate in these, these principles, really, it, it affects our um, efficiency, our effectiveness, I guess I should say, in, in living the kingdom life. And so we're going to talk about warfare. And I want to say, too, um, you know, again, the, none of these topics that we're covering are, are going to be exhaustive in nature. Okay? We're just hitting basics. So tonight, we're just going to give one little nugget of what spiritual warfare is in general. We're not going to go, I mean, you could spend a series itself on warfare. And really, any of these topics, we could spend a you know, considerable amount of time. But I want to lay, lay out a foundation for, for us as the movement as we move forward, we're inevitably engaging in spiritual warfare to, to varying degrees. And those of you individually are going to be engaging in spiritual warfare to varying degrees as well. So I want to lay a foundation for this is who we are as at the movement. And, and this is what I see scripture saying are our boundaries in spiritual warfare because there are boundaries and by not playing by the rules so to speak okay not uh, abiding by the the laws around us in the spirit world we potentially open ourselves up to demonic attack because again God is a just God and so he created this system that we would do well to to learn and to uh, learn his ways and stay within those guidelines. So we're going to look through scripture. We're going to dive into the basics of what warfare is. And you should walk away here today knowing where your boundaries are. Okay? So it's, it's incredibly important. If you don't have a teaching outline and you want one, just put your hand up and Lynn will make sure you get one. So you can follow along with us. All right, guys. Sorry. Was there? He's a boo boo. Okay. Okay. So before we get any deeper, let's just pray. The Lord's here, and we're just going to invite Him to do it once. So Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you for being who you are. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come. Just continue to knit our hearts together as a body. Lord, I just, I, I set aside my distractions right now. Lord, we want to be a people that is seeking your face. We want to be a people that abide in you and you in us. We want to be about your business. We want your heart. Give us the Father's heart. That we would look into situations through the lens of your heart. Give us the grace to walk every day more and more eating from the tree of life in the spirit. Help us to be a light in the world. And Lord, even tonight, we just ask that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you're doing, that we would follow it with you. We don't want to ask you to be a part of what we're doing. We want to be a part of what you're doing. So Lord, just bless this time with you. We just, we soak in your presence. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to every heart here. In, in the places where we're at, where you are at with us, the things that you're doing in our personal life, Lord, we just invite you to come speak deep into us. 
the things that you're doing, the revelation of who you are. And Lord, I just pray that you would uh, cleanse me, cleanse my heart, my mind, and my mouth, that I would speak what you want spoken. That we would teach your agenda tonight. We need your grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Go ahead and, and if you have your Bible, grab that and open it up to Ephesians 6. trying to find the correct outline, so give me a second. It appears as if I printed the wrong outline. So this is going to be interesting. For you. For me. Okay, so go to, go to Ephesians 6. This is really going to be from the heart now. That means it's going to be really good, right? Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to go there too. Ephesians 6. How many of you guys have heard of the, the armor of God? Okay. So Ephesians 6, starting in 10. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So this is, this is a reality check. Look, stand strong because you will encounter warfare. You will re encounter resistance. And what, what is following are, are some pieces of armor that I hope to, to soon actually take each one of those pieces of armor and go into a little more depth of what they actually mean. Because each one of those is very specifically represented by the article. For instance, why was peace represented by shoes? Why was righteousness represented by the breastplate? There are specific reasons for that. We're not going to go into that tonight, but just know there are, there are reasons for that. And, and it really actually unlocks these tools that we have to use as we protect ourselves in the Lord in our walk. Okay, so 13. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand and resist the devil in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with the truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert, with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Okay, so this is another key. Prayer is a huge part of facilitating spiritual warfare. So we have these armor, pieces of armor, that are tools kind of in our belt, but we apply these tools through prayer, okay? So again, prayer, we're not gonna go into a whole lot uh, this evening because that's another topic, and in fact, even then, we're still gonna just do a real basic uh, overview of, of prayer. And sometime, I hope to do a, a prayer series because again, there's a lot in there. Uh, in, in, in talking about prayer. So, okay. So what is spiritual warfare? Spiritual warfare is the conquering of a lesser kingdom and the advancement of a greater kingdom. 
the conquering and advance, advancing, okay? So without notes, this is gonna be really fun. <laughs> but there are two elements of warfare that I wanna talk about, okay? And they have to do with conquering and advancing. And the two elements are, and you'll see this in your notes as well, authority and power, okay? Authority and power. They are different, although we often see translations that kind of intermix the two. But just to give you an idea, these primary elements, okay, exousia, that is the Greek word that we're going to be talking about, authority, okay? Power is the Greek word dunamis. So authority is ruling, okay? It's that, uh, let's back up here, that conquering, okay? So authority is the, the ability to cause something to move into place or the ability to stop something from happening, okay? Power, on the other hand, is, can you think of what dunamis? What's a word in our English language that sounds similar? What's that? I don't know. I don't know. What did you know? Okay, so dynamite. It's explosive in nature. That's where we get that, that word. It's from the root dunamis. Okay, so it's explosive and creative in nature. Okay? And so that's the advancement, the advancing but here's the unique thing to, to note about the two, okay? Power happens within authority. Because authority, it's, it, I should say it's contained within authority. Because authority is the, the influence, the ability to influence change, okay? And, and authority says whether power can or cannot happen. Does that make sense? And so we use both, and we have both. We're going to talk about what some of the differences are between the two. And I don't have my list in front of me to give you a really, really good rundown, but we'll just say this. Authority is given by relationship. You are given authority through relationship. So if you think in kingdom terms, a, a king can give authority. He has all authority. He can give it to whom he chooses, right? Power, on the other hand, is a gift. And we know from Scripture that the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable, or other translations say are without repentance. Meaning, when God gives a gift and a calling, it is there, period. It doesn't leave you. It doesn't go away from you. We can choose to use those gifts. We can choose to understand and grow in those gifts. We can choose to not use those gifts. We can choose to use those gifts for the kingdom of God. We can choose to use those gifts and callings for ourselves. We can choose to use them for evil. Our choice. It doesn't leave. Okay? It's just a gift. So Satan, okay, has a gift and a calling. He was created... And so he has this, this gift and calling just like we do. So, so Satan has power. He never lost his power, but he did lose his authority. Okay? And so in, in the fall, back to the garden in Genesis, we see that um, God had given authority to man, right? And so when, when God gave that authority to man, and man submitted to Satan by listening to Satan and eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, man gave that authority to Satan. And so the whole point of Jesus coming was to take back those keys, take back that authority. Okay? Let's, let's turn to Matthew 10. We're going to look at some, some New Testament examples Matthew 10 1 so before we move on to there let's let's give a, a few other differences between authority and power 
So we talked about authority is, is given through relationship and, and a gift, which is power, is, is irrevocable. You just have those no matter what, right? So what are some other differences? They, they function differently. So we, we talked about authority is causing something, it's the influence, right, of something to be started or stopped. So what would be an example of that in, in, in scripture? Uh, in scripture, the removal of something or the instigating of something is authority. We see that in the healings, okay? So healing is, is always in scripture the removal of something, okay? So, so deliverance, the same thing. When, when Jesus cast demons out, that was authority. So he was saying, I have the ability, the authority, the influence to say what you can and cannot do. So I will tell you to leave or I can tell you to go, okay? So that's an example of authority. Power, on the other hand, is, is like we said, it's explosive in nature. It causes something to move, okay? And so power would be, an example in scripture would be uh, praying for like a limb that would grow, create a new, because it wasn't, it didn't take authority to, to remove anything, right? There was no demonic entity or spirit or, or sickness, but you're actually causing something to happen. So it's creative in nature. So hopefully that's just a, a, enough of a picture to give us an idea of some of the elements at play when we're, we're operating in spiritual warfare. And again, prayer is the conduit in which this power and authority flows. Okay, that's how we access God to advance his kingdom or not advance his kingdom. And, and some of those things, as we're gonna talk about, um, in spiritual warfare require him to act on our behalf because he's the only one that has the authority. Whereas there are some things he gives us authority to do, okay? And it's not authority in ourselves. He gives us authority, okay, in Jesus, right? So in the name of Jesus, we can do things, not in our own power and authority, but in his. Okay, so let's look at Matthew 10, 1 says, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Okay, so again, this is authority over unclean spirits to remove. So that's authority. Okay, let's look at Acts 1.8. Okay, so Jesus is, is risen from the dead, okay? He resurrected, and he's giving the gift of the Holy Spirit, which was promised to the disciples, okay? So it was the gift they were waiting for. And so he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the, of the earth. So again, the, the scripture we read previously in Matthew was the Greek word exousia. It gave him authority over unclean spirits to do healings, okay? But you will receive power. This is the, the Greek word dunamis, okay? So when the Holy Spirit comes upon, he empowers you to do this, okay? So the Holy Spirit gives us power, gives us boldness. It's what gives us the strength, the courage to do the things that we're called to do in the kingdom. Does that make sense? So what are our boundaries in Christ? Here's the, the, the crux of the matter. This is what we really want to talk about, okay? Because as we move forward as the movement, we need to know what are the expectations? What, what are our boundaries? And, and as we move forward in, as individuals, we need to understand what are we allowed to do and what are we not allowed to do? I think that's pretty important, right? So let's go back to, to Genesis 1, 28. So God has just created, okay? We're at the very beginning of the beginning of the beginning. And it 
it says, God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, okay? And rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Okay, so, so God had give us, given man authority over the earth, right? To subdue. In order to subdue a rule, you have to have authority, right? There are different types of authority. Um, there's positional authority, like as a pastor in an organization, a church organization, you have a positional authority, okay? Separate from authority, which is spiritual authority that is, again, given through relationship only. So it is possible for a pastor to have positional authority and have less spiritual authority than a, a kid who has a relationship and intimacy with God where he says, here you go, you're walking this thing out and you're solid, you have integrity, you have my fruits of my spirit, and because of that, I can trust you with a lot because you've been faithful in a little. And so God can give that authority to whom he pleases. And so there are differences. We're not going to go into all that, but I just want to, want to mention that. Okay. So let's look at Psalm 115. You're going to, you're going to notice a trend here. Okay? Psalm 115. The heavens are the heavens of the Lord. Or another translation say, the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth he has given to the sons of men. Okay, so again, this is just resonating with what we read in Genesis where God created, he, he created man, he created this earth, and he said, rule over this earth. I give you the authority to subdue and rule this earth. And this is saying, yes, the earth is for men. It's men's. That has been given to us by God. But the heavens are the Lord's. Okay? Important. Now let's turn to Jude. Again, I'm just laying a foundation here. This stuff is really, really important. Jude chapter 1, verse 8. So the context here in Jude is a church where ungodly men posing as godly have infiltrated the church. And really, I, I think even more specifically, if I'm not mistaken, it, it's false prophets. Okay? So Paul, false prophets, this is kind of a side note, but false prophets are, are not people with a prophetic gift that say something that is inaccurate. Okay? There's a lot of misunderstanding with what a false prophet is. A false prophet is not a prophetic person or a prophet that gets it wrong. A false prophet is someone that <laughs> a false prophet is someone that intentionally, knowingly is leading people away from Christ. Leading people to another God. Okay? So there's a difference there. But, but the context here is, is these false prophets who are, are getting in under the radar, they're sneaking in and they're, they're doing things that are not good. So they appear to be, you, you don't sneak in if, if it's noticeable, right? You sneak in because you kind of look a little bit godly. You go to church, right? But you're sowing these seeds that aren't super good. So that's, that's the, the context here. And so it's talking about these men. It says, Yet in the same way these men, also by dreaming, defile the flesh and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. But Michael, the archangel, or archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, excuse me, did not dare pronounce against him a railing or reviling judgment but said, the Lord rebuke you. Okay? So what is this saying? It's saying this. In the, the created spiritual order, we have authorities, we have levels, okay? And in the, in the created order, as it stands right now, angels are above humans. It says, 
in Scripture, we are seated a little lower than, than angels. But at one day, we will judge angels. Okay? So that role, there will be a role reversal. That's what Scripture t tells us. Okay? But right now, the, and, and in the term of angel, Michael's not just an angel. He's an archangel. So I wouldn't be going around, like, messing with Michael. He's a pretty legit dude. Okay? So he's got it going on. He's got authority. I guarantee you he's got power. But as he is wrestling with, with Satan, with the devils, what Scripture is saying here, okay? Even the arch, my, archangel Michael did not start reviling Satan. Oh, look at you. You're, you're this and you're that, right? He didn't start mocking Satan. He had respect for Satan because he understood Satan's got power. He's got a lot of power. But he has no authority. Okay? So he used, he invoked the Lord's authority and said, look, I'm not going to fight with you because it'll just be a stalemate. It's power versus power here. And we're just going to go at it all day. In fact, Satan, it's likely that Satan has more power than him given his original created gift and calling, which we said again is irre irrevocable, right? He has that. But he said, the Lord rebuke you, right? And so he just used his authority there. I don't rebuke you. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, right? So how does this translate to the church, okay? I'm sure we're all over the board with our experiences in the church and what we have experienced, what we haven't experienced. Some of us have been in conservative settings. Some of us have been in very charismatic settings and everything in between. Okay, and, and our exposures are different. But there are some church circles where a significant portion of their quote unquote worship is spiritual warfare. Okay? Not to mention, some of these churches also use their, their worship or their spiritual warfare prayer to go after powers and principalities over regions, right? And, and it, it could appear in the scripture we read in Ephesians, right? It said, you, you fight not against flesh and blood, you fight against powers and principalities of darkness, okay? That could be interpreted as, well, we're supposed to go after these powers and principalities. That's who we're fighting against, not against flesh and blood. But that's not what Paul is saying there. What Paul is saying is, we're not fighting in the natural. We're fighting against those things in that person driving them, right? And so we see that powers and principalities, again, we talked about power is a gift and a calling is a gift. So if powers and principalities are over a region, dark powers and principalities, that means there are light powers and principalities too, right? And so we see that these things are, we're going to tie this back to sowing and reaping. Powers and principalities over regions or over towns or over churches. There are different districts or levels of spheres of authority and influence. They are there as a direct result of man reaping what he sows. Okay? So if, if man is sowing into darkness... As a result, powers and principalities of darkness will be over that, that region. In the contrary, if man is righteous and repents of his ways, those authorities have, of darkness have no right to be there anymore, right? So it's a direct correlation to our sowing and reaping. He teaches his disciples how to pray. Why don't you teach us how to pray? And so Jesus is like, okay, I'll teach you how to pray. Here's a model. Play, pray like this. Okay, and we all know the Lord's Prayer. I'm not going to read through it. But here's the important part. We, we said that prayer is like the conduit for which we can engage in spiritual warfare, right? So in the model prayer, how come Jesus didn't say, I pull down this principality of lust, and I pull down this power of, of greed, and I... Why didn't he do that? If there was ever a perfect opportunity to teach us to call down powers and principalities over a region, it was there, right? 
But instead it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. You, O oh God, deliver us. Okay? And so, again, we're just reinforcing this, this sphere of influence and authority that we've been given. Okay, and we've, we've talked about how power operates within the confines of authority, right? And so we, we know that, that power, is, or excuse me, that authority is greater than power. But let's look at, at Luke 10 real quick. We're just going to give an example of that. Really giving you a workout on your fingers flipping through, right? Okay. So Jesus is talking to his disciples about the authority he has given them. And he says this, Behold, I have given you authority. That's exousia that we were talking about, right? I have given you exousia to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power, dunamis, of the enemy. Okay? Nothing but will by any means hurt you. So, so again, we see right here that in Scripture, authority, exousia, we have been given over the power of the enemy. So what authority does Satan have? Because I said he has no authority but only power. Well, that's partly true. He has authority to the degree in which we give it to him. Okay? So when we give Satan authority, then he has it because it's ours to give, right? It's a gift. Or excuse me. It's, it's through relationship, right? When you have authority, you can give authority. And so we're not going to go into the details of what how that plays out, well, how do you give Satan authority? But, but let's just suffice to say, when we come into agreement with him, we are giving him authority. When he tries to, to tempt you with something, we say, oh yeah, okay, I'll do that. You just opened a door. You just invited him. Okay? So we, we give him authority through, through a lot of different means that, that typically we're not aware of. Okay? But that's how that happens. Here's your meditation point. Ask God to show you any area in your life where you may have unknowingly operated outside of your realm of authority. So, meditate this week. Pray. Again, this is not supposed to instill fear in you. Oh no, I'm probably going to be attacked because I, didn't, I did this thing. Okay, that's not the point. But there, again, I, I talked about Jesus, God, He is just. Okay? And so if we have opened the door and left it open, it's still open. Okay? So just pray through this next week and, and prayerfully consider what God might be showing you. Maybe you, you might be surprised. You might think like, oh, man, I haven't had that thought in like years. But yeah, I shouldn't have done that, right? And so uh, if, you, if you recognize that in your life, just repent of it. And it'll close right up. There is something else before we before we close that I want to mention. And I and I I, I talked about these churches that they call down principalities and powers. Okay. And and the other issue with that is focus. Okay? Because what we learn is what you focus on, you make room for in your life. It's sowing and reaping. Basically, what you're focusing on, you are sowing into that thing, making room for that in your life. It's just like when you buy a new vehicle and all of a sudden everyone drives that vehicle, right? You ever had that experience? It's not that suddenly because you bought a Jeep, everyone's driving Jeeps. It's because it's in your frame of reference now. You focus on it. Now there's room for it. Now you see it, okay? It's the same principle. So... We have these worship services, which are really, what are we here for? We're here to worship God, right? So if we spend 30 minutes, you know, railing on powers and principalities and how the, the demon is doing this and Satan's doing that, how much time are we giving God? We are worshiping Satan when we give him more time and more energy and more focus than we do God. Okay? 
So we do that in our own life too. Again, it can be internal, it can be in your mind, it can be in your heart, where we're focusing on the enemy attacking us here and there. There's probably a demon behind that bush that's gonna jump out and gnaw on my neck or something, right? <laughs> no. Uh, maybe it will, but no, I'm kidding. Okay, so, so there's an issue here of focus. And here's one more issue, and this is probably, this is one of my pet peeves. Are you ready for it? Okay. And to be honest, until I learned this, this principle, I maybe did the same thing, to be honest. I really don't remember, but it's possible. So when we're praying, okay, I often hear people say, we bind you, Satan. You have no place here. Okay. Do you have authority over Satan in this realm? Yes, you do. If he's on earth, if he is in this room and you're looking at him face to face, you absolutely have authority over him. But have you ever stopped to think, if Satan is operating in the person you're praying for and you're binding him up, where else is he at one at this time? He must be pretty important if Satan is bothering you yourself, right? So what we are unknowingly, unwittingly doing is we are attributing a God attribute to Satan, which is omnipresence, being everywhere at every time, okay? So if two people are praying against Satan, they're basically saying Satan's here and he's there and he's probably here and there and there too at the same time. Now, in the spirit, you can travel pretty quickly, but he can't be everywhere at once, okay? So it's just one of my pet peeves because we are giving Satan something that is only God's, right? Only God can be everywhere, every time, at the same time, okay? And so, let's think about that. Let that sink in, all right? And let's focus on God and how big He is, and how awesome He is, and how incredible He is. And just leave Satan alone. Don't give him attention. That's what he wants. He is trying to distract us in every way he can to get our focus off of God. Because if we could get our focus totally on God, there's no limit to what we can do. And he trembles at the thought of the sons of God and the daughters of God becoming who they were really created to be. And if we could see God for who He is, and if we could focus on Him, and let Him into our life, where, like Scripture says, He is in us and we are in Him, and we become one, and we become communing together, Satan has no chance. So He would love to get us off track, off the rails, thinking about our crap, thinking about our stuff, afraid, of what's Satan going to do next, right? And really the, the proper response isn't really a response. It's a, it's a demeanor, it's an attitude, it's a reality of, I'm not going to give him any time. I'm going to give my time and focus to the Lord. And through that prayer, and through that communion, through that dialogue, I'll give him my concerns. I'll give him my fears and I know that he will protect me because I am in him okay so let's give a, a, a quick rundown right so authority and power are the two fundamental um, elements of spiritual warfare that, that we engage through prayer and so power we have a gift. We, we all have a, a, a level of gifting and a level of, of calling on our life. And that's in the power category. And so we, we can't really fight against the powers of evil because they have power too. But we do have authority. And God's given us authority on this earth. So when you pray for someone that has a spirit of depression, when you pray for someone that is self-mutilating, destroying themselves, or a spirit of fear, or a spirit of anything that is afflicting them, 
in Christ, you absolutely have that authority over that. And if we stay in our bounds, okay, in our sphere of influence and authority, we're going to see, as we focus on God and our, our authority there, we're going to see some changes happen. Does that make sense? Okay, so here's your challenge. Are you, are you scared? My is find one scenario, situation, whatever. Find one this week where you have an opportunity to use the authority that God's given you over this earthly realm. Use that authority to then cause a lesser kingdom to leave. Okay? So this doesn't have to be like, oh, this person has a demon. I'm going to go cast out a demon. It doesn't have to be. I mean, you can. Go for it if you want to. It can be quite interesting at times. But, you know, honestly, on that note, we, a lot of times we get what we expect. Okay? So if you're expecting to, like, be afraid and oh, I can't pray for someone with a demon, it'll like jump on me, or they're going to do something weird. Or, you know, again, what you fear, you empower. Okay, you're empowering that to happen. But if you don't make it weird, just say, anything that is affecting right now, just leave in Jesus' name. It doesn't have to be weird. You don't have to mess up their hair, right? <laughs> Praying for them. You don't have to yell and shout. Demons are not deaf. They can hear you say, go. Okay? So just look for one opportunity. And again, it doesn't have to be demonic in nature. It can be literally um, a co-worker that deals with anxiety and fear. And in conversation, you use the authority, the peace, the peace of God to exude over them and remove the fear. Okay? So it could be something that basic, where you speak a calm, peaceful word of encouragement in the midst of, well, this thing's happening, and, and, and then this happened, and then I don't even know what to do, right? So just be that peace and calm in someone's life. That's just an example. So just look for one, one situation, okay? Was I on? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I got it. Okay, so... Um, We're going to do a prayer exercise. That's your cue. So, I've just been um, just dialoguing with, with the Lord the past couple of weeks. And one of the things that He's been showing me is kind of exciting, but I'm finding it um, a little bit challenging to convey. But I just want to try and attempt to convey a little bit of, of this, and that is this. We're, how many weeks now into the movement? It's our fourth week together. We are a baby, okay? We are an infant. Infants require a lot of care, time, dedication. You know, anyone that's been a parent knows that if you want to be a good parent, you can't be selfish. Because if you're selfish, you're probably not going to be a good parent, right? So there's a level of giving up yourself, your wants and desires, and giving that away and sowing into the child, right? And so the movement is a child. And, you know, there again, we talked about sowing and reaping last week, but... We are just now, just now sowing, okay? So I just want to encourage everyone. 
we get to be the beginning of a movement, right? Who knows what God is going to do in our midst? Not because of us. I mean, the Lord knows it's not because of me, okay? But because He wants to touch people. He wants to change Goshen. He wants to change this community. He's not interested in the status quo, right? And, and I know that because in my dialogue with the Lord, I did not hear Him say, you know, we need another church as usual. Why don't you just plan another church? Right? We need more bulletins out there. Right? We need more church smiles. No. He wants to expand His kingdom, and He's willing to do that through anyone who is willing. He wants willing vessels. And so... I just want to encourage everyone. We we all are different parts of one body, right? And so as we come together, as our hearts become united and knit together as one, we have to realize we, we have unique individual gifts and callings to offer the movement. And it's not for the movement's sake. It's the movement of what the Holy Spirit is doing through us through this area, this region. Who knows how big the vision is? I don't even know how big this vision is. But the thing about starting a vision is it doesn't, you know, the sowing and reaping is it starts as a seed. You don't see the fruit right away, right? So, those that the Lord would bring here right now, we are pioneering something new. We are planting a seed, and we have to cultivate that seed every week, every day, every month. And then what we're going to find is there's going to be a deep well that begins to, to culminate. And as we sow, and again, go back to the sowing and reaping we talked about. Sometimes we've been tending this, this seed so long that we can't see that it's ever going to be a fruit. We're just ready to eat the stinking thing, right? But someone new comes along and they're like, oh man, those tomatoes, they look great. Because they realize it's only been a month. It's going to take a couple more months. But for a month, that's, that's good, right? And so in the same way, people are going to come in and out of the movement. And some people are going to come for one one day, and that's and the Lord led them there for that day and led them away because there was one little thing He wanted to give them. Okay? And we, we need to, to understand some of the realities of what it means to start something new and how everyone plays a part, everyone plays a role. And this is, you know, again, like a newborn, they make messes. They have to learn how to talk. And when they start talking, it's not super, super clear right away, right? And so it takes time be before it come, becomes mature, it becomes articulate, it becomes um, aware of everything going on. So we're going to do a prayer exercise. For some of you, this is going to be like right down your alley. For others of you, based on your gifting and your experience and all that, it's going to be a little bit of a stretch. But every one of us can do this, and, and I really believe... Again, because we are all different parts of one body, I believe the Lord has something in place right inside of each person here to, to release for the body, okay? So what we're going to do for the next couple minutes, why don't you just go ahead and close your eyes? I'm going to walk you through something, okay? So God speaking... Don't expect an audible voice in your ear, okay? God speaks through many ways, though we do not perceive it. We don't always know that it's the Lord. So what we're going to do with your eyes closed, we're just going to ask the Lord to give us His heart for what he wants to do here. Again, not for the sake of the movement, for the sake of his kingdom. What things did Jesus do when he walked the earth? What things does he expect us to do that prove that he is among us? 
that say this isn't just a church, this is a movement of people in the Spirit, in tandem with what God is doing in this area. So as we translate the things that Jesus did, what does it look like here? So what we're going to do for the next couple of minutes, just sit and let the Lord speak to you. It might be a picture of, wow, it would be cool if this. What if, what if this happened? Or it might be an impression like, I think God wants to do this. It might not be for this month. It might be for two years from now. It might be for 10 years from now. But don't discount it as just your thought. Because we're asking for God to give us a holy imagination, a holy mind of Christ, that we might see what He wants to do. So just for a couple minutes, let's just ask the Lord, Father, show us what you want to do here. Don't just show me, show us. What does it look like, Father, if your spirit is poured out here? Lord, what does it look like for people to walk in and instantly they're hit with a wave of your spirit and your presence and your love? And all of a sudden the darkness that they carried in through the crap in their life just falls off because it can't stand in your presence.